in Christ alone. We can do all things through Christ. Thank you so much for that beautiful song this morning. When we come to the book of Acts chapter 17, (coughs) we've talked about the Apostle Paul at Thessalonica and how he was ridiculed. And we talked about Paul at Berea and how he was received or how he was rejected, rather, at Thessalonica, how he was received at Berea. And then we come to Athens in verse 17, verse 16 of chapter 17, and we see that how Paul was ridiculed. Those of Thessalonica rejected the word. Those in Berea received the word. But here in Athens, we find a group of people that rejected the word. And ridiculed, rather, ridiculed the word. And when Paul arrives in this great city of Athens, he doesn't come here as a sightseer in Athens of Greece, but he comes as a soul winner. He comes with one purpose in mind, and that is to give the gospel of Jesus Christ to this city that was wholly given over to idolatry. I want us to take up the reading in this chapter in verse number 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he, or he reasoned with them in the synagogue, with the Jews and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. Wherever Paul had a chance, whether it be in the temple or in the streets, in the marketplace, he would begin reasoning with people about the message of the gospel. And there were certain, notice verse 18, then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and said, and some said, what will this babbler say? Others said, Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, and saying, May we know that, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, and we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but to either tell or to hear some new thing. Notice here this was a city that was given over to philosophies and reasonings and debatings. And the Bible says in verse 22, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. He hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him, in Christ, in him alone, Notice, in Him we live, we move, and we have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought to think, not to think, that the Godhead is like unto gold, or silver, or stone, graven by art, or man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man. By that man, talking about Jesus, whom he hath ordained. 
whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Talking about Jesus here. And when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this uh, matter. And so Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed, among the which was Dionysus, the Arab Pagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. I'm preaching this morning on knowing the unknown God. Notice, please, in your Bible, in verse 23, when Paul came to this city that was given over to idolatry, he noticed in their devotion to the idols that there, were, there was an idol or several idols that had the inscription to the unknown God. To the unknown God. <coughs> I think my batteries may have went out on me here. Let's go back to this. To the unknown God. And the Bible says that him that you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Paul said, you don't know who this God is, I'm going to tell you all about him. <laughs> and so Paul clears off a spot and he begins to reveal to them this God that they do not know. Because Paul knows God. Father, bless the reading of your word and use the message you've given me to speak to the hearts of people. In Christ's name we ask these things. Amen and amen. <coughs> When Paul comes to the city of Athens, Athens is a center of culture and education and philosophy. It, had, uh, it was home to a famous university and beautiful buildings, but there was one problem with this city. It had become given over to idolatry. Cultured, it was nothing more than paganism, uh, nourished by idolatry and novelty and philosophy the Greek religion, if you will. It was a religion that ministered to art and amusement. and uh, It was lacking of moral power. Uh, the Greek myths spoke about gods and goddesses. And, uh, and they had plenty of gods and plenty of idols that they worshipped. As a matter of fact, Josephus, the great Jewish historian, once said that in Athens it was easier to find a god small g-o-d, than to find a man. It was easier to find a God than to find a man. And when Paul saw this city that was wholly given over to this, to the worship of idols, the Bible says something stirred in his heart. His spirit stirred within him. And uh, he was troubled. He was broken and grieved. Paul knew that idolatry was demonic. And uh, the many gods of the Greeks were only characters in stories, such as Zeus and many others that we know of, characters in stories that were unable to change men's lives. And the Greeks did not know the true God. And uh, <coughs> when we think about Greece, we think about a beautiful city, we think about Athens, we think about Socrates and and Aristotle and all of these thinkers, great thinkers of the day. Uh, but notice, the Bible talks here about this, this city given over to idolatry. And notice the two groups of people that he has to deal with. He has to deal with the Epicureans and the Stoics. These two groups of philosophers... They both represented different schools of philosophy. Uh, the Epicureans, notice please in your Bibles down in verse number 18. The Bible says these philosophers of the Epicureans and the Stoics. Notice these two groups of people he had to deal with, he had to encounter. The Bible talks about here that the Epicureans, they were people that were materialistic, they were atheists. Their goal in life was pleasure and indulgence, if you will. Uh, they denied the existence of life after death. 
the Epicureans. They professed to believe in gods, but their idea was is that the gods they believed in had no interest in mankind. It was a world left to itself. And so the Epicureans, their idea was to, to live it up, to enjoy life. And then the Stoics were the opposites. They were what we would call modern-day pantheists. They were fatalist. Their leading belief that was that man should live according to nature, that God was in nature. The, the creator, if there was one, was captured in his creation or confined to his creation. They, their gods were confined in nature. They, I met a guy recently here that I was witnessing to not too far from our church. I knocked on his door and talked to him about the Lord. Tried to, and when I got to the point about believing in God, and he said to me that he believed that God was in, and he pointed to a tree in his front yard. He says, I, I worship nature. I believe God is in the tree in my yard. And I'm telling you, this. we see people like this today. And I said to him, well, I believe more than that. I believe that God made that tree in your yard. He's their creator. But the Stoics, they were those that were indifferent to life, if you will. And uh, we think about someone today being Stoic, meaning that they're apathetic, they're stern. And so here on one side, you got the Epicureans who enjoyed life, and you got the opposite, you got the Stoics who just looked at life as something to endure. But Paul comes along and says that life. I'm going to tell you about a life that you don't have to endure. I'm going to tell you about a life that you can enter into. And that is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we see that as Paul preached the gospel here, as Paul reasoned with them, there were different responses. There were those that had contempt. Uh, they, they withstood him. Then there were those that had curiosity. They wanted to hear more about it. Then there were those later that believed. They, they, were, they had conversion. They were converted. And so Paul is giving his defense on Mars Hill. And Mars Hill was not just a place, but it was a, a council. Today we would talk about Capitol Hill. It was a place of the council of, the, of those of Areopagus. It was the highest court in Greece. And they were responsible to watch over all civil and criminal and religious matters in the city. And so when Paul came along preaching Jesus and the resurrection, uh, this new thing, they thought, well, this Paul, they didn't put Paul on trial, but they brought him before the court, before the council, uh, to, to share with them this doctrine that he was preaching. They always wanted to hear some new thing, and so... They looked at Paul not as, you know, some, some kind of a person that was blasphemous. He wasn't on trial. But they were curious about what he had to say. And so Paul begins by talking about the altar. By talking about this altar that they had dedicated to an unknown God. And he proceeds to tell them, first of all, that God is. That God is. He establishes the fact that God is. He says, this one that, you've, that you worship ignorantly, him declare I unto you. And Paul began to tell them about the God that he knows, the God that is. And by the way, if we're going to be saved, the very first thing we have to believe is that God is. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, uh, it tells us that... Uh, <coughs> He that cometh unto God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I've met people today, and I'm sure you've met people that try to tell you there is no God. Anybody ever met somebody like that? They try to tell you they don't believe in God, there is no God. How can you, how can you, how can you introduce to someone God if they don't believe God? They don't believe that he exists. People try to tell you they're atheists today. Very few people are really atheists. By the way, if somebody ever says to you that they're an atheist, just ask them a question. If they say there's no God, then ask them, 
Have you been everywhere in the universe? Have you been everywhere in the universe? Now, if they tell you yes, you've got a whole other problem to deal with. <laughs> uh, they're crippled too high for crutches, <laughs> as we'd say in the South. <laughs> But most likely, they will tell you, no, they've never been everywhere in the universe. Then you could say to them, well, then you really don't know that there is no God. You can only say that you think there is no God. So really, you're not an atheist, you're an agnostic. <laughs> uh, you choose to believe that, that God doesn't exist. Einstein said that anybody who didn't believe in a cosmic power was a fool. Then he went on to say, but we can never know him. Well, Einstein was right about the first statement, but he was wrong about the second statement. We can know God. We can know God. Paul said, him declare I unto you. Paul knew that God is. He knew not only that God is, but him that comes from God under God must believe that he is. Nobody's ever going to get to God if they don't believe that God is. The Bible says in Psalm 14, 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Foolish people talk that way. They deny God. And I'm trying to tell you this morning that Paul opens up his address to them by talking about their altar to the unknown God. And I got to thinking about that, doing a little research on it. <coughs> I read that 600 years prior to Paul's visit there to Athens, there was a terrible plague in the area. And there were God's little statues everywhere. And so the idea was that one of these gods must be angry at us. And so there was a poet from Crete by the name of Epimendites, who came up with a plan. His plan was, we got to figure out which one of these gods is uptight, upset with us because of this plague, because of this judgment. And so what he did is he took hundreds of black sheep and white sheep on Mars Hill and he turned the sheep loose. And as they went down the hillside and went around, if they would go and lay beside, if they lay down beside a statue, a god, they would sacrifice that sheep there to that god, to appease that god. Anywhere a sheep would lay down beside a statue, they would offer as a sacrifice that sheep to that statue. And anywhere a sheep would lay down that it wasn't near a god or a statue, they would build an altar there to the unknown god just in case there's a God somewhere that we don't know that's judging us, let's build an altar to that God. And that's what, that's a legend. That's, that's a, something I've read in two different, uh, two different uh, things about history regarding Athens and Greece. And so here's, here they are offering, sacrificing sheep to gods that don't exist, and then they're building idols to the unknown God. And then Paul comes along and he says, I'm going to tell you about the true God of the Bible and I'm going to introduce to you who he is and what he can do. Notice several things this morning. Number one, Paul shares with them just some basic truth. Number one, he shares with them the greatness of God. He talks about that my God is a creator. Look at verse number 24, please. And Acts 17, the Bible says in verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Do you see that? Paul says, let me tell you about my God. He is a creator God. He created. He created. And thank God this morning that we don't have to question that. We can look in the very first verse of our Bible and see that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We don't have a God that is distant from his creation. We don't have a God that is imprisoned or locked in his creation like the Stoics believe. But we have a God that, is, that cannot be confined in man-made temples or in statues. He's too great for that. 
He's a wonderful God that is a creator God. Paul declares to them the greatness of God and that he creates. He creates. Now, there's so many theories today that I could preach about, and that's a whole other lesson today or sermon, but to talk about what evolutionists believe today. And there was once a puddle out here somewhere, and in that puddle there was a one-celled being and that one-celled being said, let's, let's become two. And so then those two said, let's, let's, this is fun. Let's, let's become four. And so now you've got four and, and you have life coming from that puddle. And all that we have today, all that I'm looking at this morning came from that. And, and so many ideas. But the problem is, the question needs to be asked is, who made the puddle? <laughs> Where did the one-celled being come from? The Bible tells us very clearly, it's a God. Our God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, look in your Bibles in Hebrews chapter 3 just a moment. I don't mean to chase a rabbit here, but look in Hebrews chapter 3. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse number 4, I believe it is. Listen to what the Word of God says. For every house is built by some man. But he that built all things is who? Is God. Can you imagine going up to some house that somebody built? Uh, or somebody goes, I want to show you my new house. Can you imagine that? It's wonderful. Come over and see my new house. And This lumber yard company delivered a whole pile of lumber and they dumped it right here and set a stick of dynamite and it blew up and all of it landed just like this. Can you imagine that? Somebody talking like that. The fireplace is exactly where I wanted it to be and all the bedrooms are the size I wanted and, and uh, the plumbing was just right. The kitchen was in the just the right spot. Everything was terrific. I, I just can't believe all this happened like this by happenstance. <laughs> We'd say that guy's an idiot, Right? But the Bible tells us, for every house is built by some man, and he that built all things is of God. I'm trying to say this morning, the heavens declare his handiwork. He is the creator God. The Bible says in Psalm 94, verse 9, He who hath planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? Uh, he who chastises the nations, shall he not correct? He who teaches man knowledge, shall he not know? In other words, God is saying that intelligent, intelligence comes from intelligence. One who creates has to be able to hear. One who creates sight has to see. One who makes moral judgments has to be a moral being. That's what God is saying here. All of what we have doesn't come out of nothing. It comes by the creative hand of God. It doesn't come... Uh, as, a, as a means of evolution. I believe that God created everything. And the Bible defends that. I could read so many verses I've got written down. I heard a poem years ago that said, Three monkeys sat in a coconut tree <laughs> discussing the things that were said to be. Said one to another, Now listen, you two. There's a certain rumor, but it can't be true. That man descended from our noble race. Why, the very idea, it is a disgrace. No monkey ever deserted his wife or starved her babies and ruined her life. Nor did you ever know a mother monk to leave her babies with others to bunk. Or pass them on from one to another till they scarcely knew who was their mother. And another thing you'll never see is a monkey build a fence around a coconut tree and let the coconuts go to waste, forbidding all other monkeys to have a taste. Well, if I build a fence around the coconut tree, starvation would cause you to steal from me. And here's another thing a monkey won't do. Go out at night and get on a stew or use a gun, a club, or a knife to take another monkey's life. Yes, man descended the honorary cuss, but brother, he didn't descend from us. <laughs> That's true, isn't it? I'm glad this morning we have a creator God. And Paul declared to them the greatness of God and that he is creator. He also declares to them in this message that the goodness of God and that he is a provider. 
I want you to look in verse 25 of our text. Look in verse 25. The Bible says <coughs> about this God that he made the world. That's creator. But notice the Bible says, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, and he dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life breath and all things. God is a provider. The unknown God cares for us. He's Lord of his creation. He didn't, he didn't just create it, but he rules. He's Lord. He's provider over his creation. You know, men today want to pride themselves in serving God, but Paul says here that our God serves man. If God is God, then he's self-sufficient. He needs nothing, Paul is saying. There's no need that you have to supply with our God. He is self-sufficient. He supplies our needs, the scripture says. Not only do our temples do not contain God, but the services in the temples add nothing to God, Paul is saying. In those two brief statements, Paul wipes out their re entire religious system of Greece. Paul said, it's, our, it's my God who gives life, breath, and all things. He's the source of every good and perfect gift. Paul is saying, my God sustains life by his goodness. And it is my God's goodness that leads us to repentance. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2. I'm glad this morning that we serve not only a great God who is creator, but we serve a good God who is a provider. And he provides all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Aren't you glad for that this morning? Paul is saying that the temples of man can't contain my God. My God cannot be managed. He can't be manipulated. He can't be confined. You can't put him in a box. Paul is saying, I, I serve a great God, a good God that provides. And he said that he's the ruler of the universe. He, he's too big. He fills the heavens and the earth. And I could go on and on and talk about that this morning. And by the way, God doesn't live in this building either. <laughs> Thank God we have a beautiful building to meet in this morning. Uh, but God doesn't live in this building, but our God indwells the heart and life of every believer. I'm glad this morning when I leave this building, God goes with me. He promised he would never leave me nor forsake me. He said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the earth. I didn't come over this morning and put on some religious cloak and, and put God on at the door and take him off when I leave this morning, but God is with me always, and he provides day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, we have a God that provides his, his goodness. And Paul says, to this group of people, this God that you don't know, I know him. He's creator. He's provider. He giveth life, breath, and all things. And Paul goes on to say, not only that, but he's ruler. Look at verse 26. I'm closing. Notice he rules. The Bible says, verse 26, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds or the boundaries of their habitation. What's that all about? Paul is saying the unknown God, he controls you. He controls us. You see, the gods of the Greeks were distant gods. They had no concerns about the problems and the needs of men. But our God, the creator God, is also a God of history and a God of geography. He creates, the Bible says, and we see this here. He's not some distant deity. We don't have a God that's unrelated. The Bible says we have a, not in high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was all in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. I'm glad this morning we can cast our care upon him, for he careth for us. He's ruler. In him we live and we move and we have our being. Paul got this truth across to them that our God controls not only destiny but he controls history. He's a God of everything. He keeps it all together. He's, he's ruler. 
He's ruler. He gave creation its life, its breath, and everything it has. Thank God for that. So this led to Paul's logical conclusion was this. God made us in His image, so it's foolish for us to make little gods in our image. <laughs> and that's what they were doing. They were making little gods in their image. And Paul said, no, no, I've got something better than that. I've got a God who made us into His image. Amen? And that's the God we serve this morning, the, the Creator God, a God who provides, a God who rules. He rules. And then lastly, not only do I see the, the goodness of God and, and these things, but I see the grace of God here. I see He's Savior. He's Revealer. He reveals Himself through the Savior. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen who? You've seen the Father. God reveals Himself this morning. The question is, do you believe God is? And the second question is, who is God to you? Well, we, we know the Bible answers those questions because God's Word tells us who God is. And the Bible tells us if we've seen the Lord Jesus, we've seen God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal. We see the triune God all through the scriptures. And Paul says, this God that I declare to you, he's Savior. He's revealed himself. Notice what he says down in verse number 27. That ye should seek the Lord, if happily are in hope that you might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. In other words, Paul is saying here that this God that I'm revealing to you, I'm declaring to you, is a God that is Savior. He reveals. He's the revealer. He's close to every one of us. People say, well, wait, wait a minute. What about that person way off in deepest, darkest Africa somewhere that has never has heard the Bible? Well, the Bible tells us that God reveals himself in many ways. Two ways that God reveals himself to mankind is something on the inside, our conscience. And on the outside, God reveals himself through his creation to us. And the Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 1, because God has revealed himself to man through conscience, there's an innate knowledge on the inside that 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 there is God and God has revealed himself through conscience and because God has revealed himself through his creation, the Bible says in verse 20 of Romans chapter 1 that man will be without excuse. The Bible says because that, he, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Notice that. Look at Romans chapter 1 verse 19 just a moment. I'll close with this. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 19. You say, Pastor, how can we know God? Well, the Bible tells us in verse 19 of Romans 1, because that which may be known of God is manifest where? In them. The light of conscience God puts within the heart of every man. And then the Bible says in verse 20, for the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I don't have time to get into all of that this morning, but I'm trying to tell you that God wants us to know Him. He wants to be revealed to us. God wants to be our Savior. He's not hiding Himself from His creation, but God has revealed Himself. And Paul is preaching this great truth to the people in Athens. And he goes on to preach about Jesus Christ and about who he is and his resurrection. And the Bible says when they heard about that, <coughs> chapter 17 at the end of it, when they heard about the resurrection, 
The Bible says you find these three responses. Some mocked. Some said, we're curious. We're going to hear you another time about this. But some believed the message Paul had to give. And may I say this morning, you and I are living in a world that is much like the culture and the philosophy that you find here in the Bible and among the people of Athens. People today have, have rationalized God out of their mind, out of their heart. They, they're so philosophical that they've reasoned away the existence of God. They've reasoned away the, creation, the creator God. They've accepted lies, the Bible says. That same chapter in Romans chapter 1, the Bible says, here's what they did, because they knew God, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. But they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. By the way, that's what happens to people who are given over to idols, people who... You say, well, Pastor, I don't know anybody today that worships little, little statues and idols. i tell you what idolatry is in its purest form. is anything that you and I set above God in our life. That's idolatry. Your idol may be money. It may be fame. It may be power. It may be something physical. It may be the pleasures of this world. But anything you put before God, Exodus, the book of Exodus says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, saith the Lord. And that's idolatry. All of us are worshiping something or someone. And Paul said, we need to worship the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. And may the Lord help us today to see him as creator, as provider, as ruler, and as Savior. May we pray together this morning.